The bread offered in the tabernacle was only to be eaten by the Levites. And David asked for bread when he's running from Saul, and the priest gave him that bread. Very interesting. Now, we'll talk about that in 1 Samuel 21 in just a moment. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. A very good time. We're going to look at this today. So, Corey, what are you doing? Well, today I have some show and tell that I'm really excited about. It has to do with ancient games and ancient divination. It's going to be fun. Ryan? Well, today I'm going to be jumping ahead a chapter to 1 Samuel 24 to talk about David cutting off a piece of Saul's robe and why it was so significant. Very good. And also, this is a day when you have mm. some very interesting things for us. Yes, because it's Friday. So we have our Friday wrap-up question, and that means anywhere from the book of Ruth through to 1 Samuel chapter 23. First Samuel 21, 1 through 15. Now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? So David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has ordered me on some business and said to me, Do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young men have at least kept themselves from women. Then David answered the priest and said to him, Truly, women have been kept from us about three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread, which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. And David said to Ahimelech, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. So the priest said, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madmen in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 15. A fugitive and a madman. That's what we're talking about today. And really, that's a good title because the Bible tells us of characters and people in the Bible here that are not really doing things God's way and some who are. Now, this is fascinating because there's fugitives who shouldn't be fugitives and there's people who are fugitives who shouldn't be good. And yet 
that's a conflict. Well, that's normal because things have always gone sideways for ancient Israel. David's Israel, and up, David Israel's up and coming king, was running for his life. In a reading today, we find David coming to Nob. Now, this is the place where Ahimelech, the priest, was stationed. Not wanting to reveal the real circumstance for his arrival, David tells the priest that he's been sent on a mission by the king. See, in this way, King Saul would not be able to accuse Ahimelech of helping David as a fugitive. Now, it's interesting that David headed for Israel's central place of worship, the tabernacle. On the one hand, he was looking for weapons to arm himself with. On the other hand, he may have wanted to inquire of God. Now, why was he running for his life? This is David. And David begins his immersion into some very dark but learning times. The first thing he would do is leave there and head for Philistine territory to preserve his life. This seems to be the way David thinks. Is God still there? Does he love me? I'll, I'll head to the enemies of the camp. This must have been very frustrating for David when you begin to think about it, because as you continue to focus on what God is doing and how God speaks, you don't understand necessarily why this is happening until later on. Now, take your Bible guide. The Bible guide is right here and turn to the passage today. This is very interesting as we study 1 Samuel chapter 21. And as we do so, and by the way, if you don't have a Bible guide, you can call us or write to us. We'll send you one and also go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and it takes you to a donate page where you can help us. And when you send or call or write or whatever you do, thank you so much for your donations. They truly do help us to send it to you and they keep the cost down and all that sort of thing. They help us as we put it towards this program. And, and if you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, you can download it exactly how we printed it so you can have your own copy. Let's pray today and ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, we ask you as we study 1 Samuel 21. Now, this is a fascinating read, but we, we need to hear this. So help us today as we open our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel 21, let's look at it. It says, Now David came to Nob, Ahimelech to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when David when he met with David and said to him, why are you alone? And no one is with you. So David said to Ahimelech the priest, well, the king has ordered me on some business and said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I have just directed my young men to search such and such a place. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, there is no communion or rather there is no common bread on hand, but there is only holy bread. If the young men have at least kept themselves from women, then David answered the priest and said, yes, truly women have been kept from us about three days since I came out and the vessels of the young men are holy. And the bread is still, or bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated for vessels on this day. So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there, but the show bread, which had been taken from before the Lord, in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. Now, this brings me to a first point. Normally, only the priest ate the holy bread, but Ahimelech gave it to David. Now listen carefully. Beloved, we may not understand why God takes us to certain places. He will take us to places we are not used to. In the will of God, there are many times I've gone and I've said, well, this is great. I'm going to go here. But God takes me somewhere else. And I'm like, why am I here? And then all of a sudden I see something and I'm like, that's why God took me here. God does that on a regular basis to those who follow his word and his will. We need to keep that in mind. And David went there, got the bread, and he understood. Now listen to this, because this is really important. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, 
detained before the Lord. And his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chief of herdsmen who belonged to Saul. And David said to Ahimelech, is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. So the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephah. If you will take that, take it. For there is no other except that one here. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Beloved, listen. Ahimelech gave David the sword of Goliath. Now remember, God prepares us to fight for his cause. What I find interesting about this passage is that God equips David. I don't know how this happens, but this is a big sword. It's as if God gave him the ability to defend Israel on that day. And yet he's an enemy of the king. Isn't that interesting? He's not an enemy because the people thought it, but because Saul thought it. Well, this gets really interesting now in verse 10. It says, Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is that not David, the king of the land? David, the, the king of the land? Listen to what he said. And they did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now, David took these words to heart, and he was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, and he pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors and gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see, the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman? that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence. Shall this fellow come into my house? Remember number three, David was afraid of the Philistine king and acted like a madman in front of him. Beloved, we often do not understand who God places in front of us. <laughs> I want to tell you something. This is really important. As we focus on this, we will be placed in front of people. Some of them are very, very staunch enemies of what we believe. God has put us there for a reason. Through the Holy Spirit of God, He is the one who overcomes. And He is the one who helps us. Let's remember that because we will be faced with many things these coming years. And so we need to trust in God and allow His Word to continue to work as we work in His kingdom. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. All right, so today our assigned Bible reading is 1 Samuel chapters 20 to 23. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I'm going to jump ahead a chapter to chapter 24. And in this passage, we read about King Saul's continuing effort to find and kill David. And during his search, Saul enters a cave to relieve himself. But funnily enough, he unknowingly enters the very cave in which David and his men were hiding. And Saul remains unaware of their presence. And David could have easily taken the king's life here. But instead, he chooses to sneak up behind him and cut off a corner of his robe. And this was highly significant. Here's why. In the year that King Uzziah died, declares the prophet Isaiah, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In the ancient cultures, garments played an important role, which is why Isaiah's observation concerning the Lord's robe and specifically to the train of his robe, is especially significant. The Hebrew word for train is shul, which means hem, border, fringe, bottom edge of a skirt or train. In the ancient world, the hem or fringes of a garment represented authority. 
Thus, to cut off the hem of one's garment was to strip that person of his authority and personality. In fact, a husband could divorce his wife by simply cutting off the hem of her robe. A nobleman could authenticate his name on a clay tablet by pressing his particular hem on a clay tablet. It was like a signature or seal. Thus, when David cut off the hem of Saul's garment, he was cutting off his genealogy that was embroidered in the hem. That was his symbol of kingship. This is why David later repented of that act against the Lord's anointed. Joseph's so-called coat of many colors was actually a seamless robe with a special hem which implied a position of privilege. When Ruth asked Boaz to put his hem over her, she was putting the claim of leveret marriage upon him, which he of course accepted. In God's covenant with Israel, he declares in Ezekiel 16.8, I will spread the edge of my garment over thee. In other words, God was putting his authority, his mantle, his protection, and his covering over Israel. In fact, according to the Mosaic law, every Jew was obliged to wear a fringe or tassel at each of the four corners of the outer garment, one thread of each tassel to be deep blue. These tassels were to be to them a perpetual reminder of the law of God and of their duty to keep it. This means that Jesus, as an obedient Jew, would also have had these tassels. In fact, this was the very hem which the woman with the issue of blood wanted to touch, because conceptually that's where his authority was. Of course, Jesus also wore a seamless robe, which interestingly enough was never torn during his crucifixion, perhaps signifying that his priesthood is without end. Indeed, according to the vision of Isaiah, our Lord still wears a robe in his heavenly habitation, and the train or hem of that robe fills the temple. Hence, as Jesus himself declared to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So the train, hem, or edge of the garment in the ancient cultures and in the Bible represented authority. So by cutting the hem off of Saul's garment, David was making a huge statement. And we saw a similar scene back in 1 Samuel 15, when the rebellious Saul grabs Samuel by his robe to keep him from leaving. And what happens? uh, Saul accidentally tears the robe, and Samuel says to Saul, Indeed, this is a sign that the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Not good. Yeah, that, that's a part of their robe. It's a part of their dress, and that's all part of the kingship. And uh, yeah. so that's fascinating. When David comes out and he says he got down on the ground and he said, you know, I was going to do this and my men told me to kill you, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was really, really something. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent. Corey? All right. Are you guys ready for show and tell? I am. Yes, of course I am. I'm going to move my coffee. (laughs) Okay. So I brought some, and and I have a hard time pronouncing this, so I hope I get it right. I brought some astragali with me today. Um, Astragali. I'm going to pour them out on the table. Astragali uh, are essentially an ankle bone of an animal. So we've got uh, we've got sheep ankle bones here. Uh, and in the ancient world, they were most often of sheep and goats. Uh, and when I say ankle bones, so you know how the back, the back leg of a sheep or a goat angles out like this, it is this bone right here. Uh, as opposed to, we would normally call this the ankle, but it's actually this bone right here. So I have about 20 with me today. Uh, and uh, what these are, uh, they were used as game pieces in the ancient world. Like as far back as we can find human remains, we find these astragali. Uh, and we know that they were used as game pieces because we have a uh, pictorial evidence uh, from the Hittite culture and from a, a couple other cultures. There's there's carvings of children and grownups playing games with these ankle bones. Uh, we also have uh, physical evidence of these ankle bones in various different contexts, whether that's in people's houses, they are in graves, and they're also in ritual and religious context that we will get to. Uh, But sometimes these ankle bones were actually modified uh, to be better for gameplay. So these ones are not modified at all. This is just the, 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 the straight ankle bone. But sometimes these rough edges would be shaved down uh, or it'd be cut in half. Sometimes even 
uh, there would be markings on the different sides uh, for different game pieces. They've, uh, they've found all sorts of interesting words put on them. And uh, in other cases, a hole could be drilled in the center of these bones and it could be filled with lead or bronze to create it basically a weighted dice. And some of these games I have I have found through my research are still played in places like Syria, Iran, and Iraq. They're still played today. And basically what happens is you throw a bunch of the, the ankle bones and you get the weighted, weighted ankle bone and you throw it and you try to disperse them. And this made me think of, Ryan, do you remember from the 90s Crazy Bones? Do you remember Crazy Bones from the 90s? Do, do any of you remember Crazy Bones? I'm not crazy, these were a thing. I don't actually crazy remember bones. that. They were plastic bones and you played that. You had one where you, you would slam the, the one of the bones against the other bones. They so had faces and everything like this in it. When I was doing research for this, uh, this segment is gonna be a proper segment put together with pictures soon. It made me think of that because in the ancient world, people would also make recreations of uh, of these ankle bones in other materials like gold, silver, bronze, even glass. They would make uh, recreations of it. Okay, so there there's some evidence that uh, these ankle bones were also worn as amulets or talismans. Now, they don't have any uh, pictorial representations of that, but they have found a few that have a hole bored all the way through it, like right at the top, that would be perfect for wearing as a necklace, a necklace or an amulet. So there's a, a tiny bit of evidence, but, but not a ton on that. But there is a lot of evidence, both written and physical evidence of these ankle bones also being used in the ancient practice of divination. And so they would, they have found mass quantities, like several hundreds of these ankle bones found in jars in temple precincts or religious areas, cultic areas all over the ancient Middle East. And the idea behind it, uh, normally the bones are from sheep and goats. Normally it's from a male, uh, adult male, sheep or goat. Sometimes it's from various kinds of deer that they can find, but that's, it represents such a small portion of that. And the idea is that these probably were from sacrificed animals, the ones in the religious context, and may have represented the sacrifice itself. So as the animal was being butchered to remove a skin, uh, sometimes they know the practice was to actually start there at the ankle bone and uh, using some sort of uh, tube to actually blow air through a bellows or with the mouth to kind of balloon up the skin and separate it from the muscle and, and save the skin. But nevertheless, these ankle bones may have come to represent the sacrifice themselves so people could give them as a as a token of their dedication to whatever religion that they or religious cult that they were a part of or whatever God they were worshiping. Then a priest could come along and choose a few of the bones from that collection of offerings and they would throw it on a table uh, and then they would essentially prophesy the future by where those bones landed and how they landed and, and, and things of that nature. So that, uh, that is a known practice from the classical period, from the Greek and Roman times, but then also there's physical evidence of that going back into the time period of the kings of Israel and even before that. So fascinating. So, so they would, they would actually use those bones for divination to predict the future? Yeah. I, so you use dead bones to predict the future. Yeah, and it's similar to, I mean, they would use, we know um, in certain contexts that they would use the sacrificial animal's liver and kidneys to also uh, predict the future or to get a yes or no answer. So this is a similar This is a similar thing. Uh, we do have, uh, I think it's in the Iliad, there's, there's mention of, of like a, a an actual process of divination, and then um, there's a there's a few other examples of it happening. That gives a really good explanation of when God says, "Take the rest of the animal after the sacrifice and burn it." Yeah, mm -hmm. get rid of it. Yeah, burn it up outside the camp. Yeah, and, fascinating. And, and it's it's really interesting to me that, like for example, we we also know that that sometimes these would be used as foundational deposits for houses. So the idea of taking the image of your devotion mm -hmm. and then 
of your devotion to like a protecting God and then building your house on the image of that devotion. Oh, man. So things of that <clears throat> nature. But anyway, wow. there's lots to talk about. We you don't have to do that. Seconds. These what? ones are just right? for Give games. us a question. <laughs> right. These are for games. Really interesting and stuff. we build our foundation on God. Exactly. Minute, 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 exactly. Seconds. Yes, thank We're you. Good. What was the name of Naomi's husband? What was the name of Naomi's husband? Was it Boaz? Was it Abiathar? Or was it Elimelech? What was the name of Naomi's husband? Boaz, Abiathar, or Elimelech? What do you think? Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. confident. I think we're pretty yeah, confident. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Elimelech. All right. Let's take a look at chapter uh, one in Ruth. We can see it actually in verse two and three. I'm going to read three. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So if you, along with Ryan and Corey, guessed Elimelech, then you are absolutely right. Wonderful. And we'll Excellent. be doing this again next Friday with a new question. We will. And make sure that you get your Bible guide. If you don't know how to get it, call us or write to us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the Bible guide and it takes you to the place where you can download it exactly how we've printed it. Very, very important. I want to pray for India. This is a great country. I went there when I was, I was about 17, 18 years old, and I worked with Dr. Mark Buntain, who's a great missionary. Excellent place in Calcutta. We went to many places, but we need to pray for India, the world's largest democracy. Father, help us today as we focus our attention, not on ourselves, but on other places. We pray for India. Help them, Lord, and heal them and touch the churches there. In Jesus' name, and all of us said together, Amen.